Lego Island Extreme Stunts is a useless cream on the stump of a man with no arm. You can't save Lego Island's missing arm, the cream won't work. Just give up. Be Pepper, the stunt man hero. Oh yes, because as we all know, Pepper is the master of all stunts. Speaking of, you're gonna spell extreme with an X, but not spell stunts with a Z? That's a missed opportunity there. How do you think you'll sell this game to the kids? Right, I'm ready to go. What have you got in store for me, Lego Island 3? So I gave the disc a thorough clean, it started working, and this is the first thing that I see. Amazing! Well, as it turns out, Lego Island 3 is all about Pepper being the stuntman in an upcoming movie being filmed on the island. And that that's it, really. And after the beginning with that... Um, epic stunt, we then get thrown into another stunt where we just drive a car and deliberately crash it over and over again. Not sure that's classifiable as a stunt, but if it is, I suppose that means Lindsay Lohan is the greatest stunt driver of all time. Well, hey, howdy, hey, look at that. I got a high score, and my name is Dad. What's upsetting, though, is that after all of that, I don't think I could have done the stunt that well because everything that I just did wasn't even used in the cut that they filmed. I'm pretty sure that isn't even me. Are they just sick and tired of Pepper and his stupid pun name and want to try killing him while pretending he's going to be in a Hollywood movie? Is this stunt movie just a big convenient cover-up to murder Pepperoni in a horrible accident? I gotta say, I'm feeling very sorry for him right now. <laughs> I gotta say, I don't feel sorry for him right now. Now, I may have joked earlier about Pepper being a terrible master of stunts, but I'll be damned, he's had a serious upgrade to his movement from Lego Island 2. He can properly skateboard and do tricks whenever he wants, he can double jump stupidly high for some great explorative platforming. For a PS2 game, Extreme Stunts looks pretty good, and much like Bionicle, runs as smooth as butter, making the exploration around the island more enjoyable along with the great controls. This is the best island in the Lego Island series by far, followed by the first one, and the second one didn't happen. Sure, the car physics are a bit shit, Pepper, stop it, but so far I like this game. I even found myself a skate park to get the hang of the wonky skateboard trick controls, and before you're able to start filming other stunts, you need to get a license to drive, a license to fly, and a license to water. After which, you don't only get to film the said stunts in little mini games to progress the story, but also get to use the vehicles that you got the license for all around the island anytime you want. As for the lessons themselves? <laughs> I passed with flying colours. Instead of brute forcing you into a series of lacklustre and childish mini games that you have no choice but to do in the order they make you, like in Lego Island 2, all you do here is explore, find bricks to build different animals around the area, collect trading cards, and do the stunt missions as and when you want to, depending on how many items you've earned from other mini games based on helping other locals out with their own problems and doing other stunts. Now, there is a side plot, believe it or not. You aren't just filming a stunt movie, you're also trying to catch the brickster on camera trying to murder you on the set. Why is he out of prison? And you'd think that after one miserable slide puzzle that proves definitively that the Brickster is trying to end me, that would be enough proof to lock him back up. You need more to put that pesky Brickster behind bars. But no, what are you, stupid? My best! No, you're on Lego Island, where intelligence comes to perish. Out of all of these things, though, you want to know why this is the best Lego Island game I've played for this video? Because Pepper shuts his gob and doesn't say anything. My sack is so heavy. Yep, just when you thought they couldn't mess it up anymore and that they should have let Crash Team Racing die with dignity, here we have another Crash Kart Racer, Tag Team Racing. But it's okay because Jetix Magazine says it's the best Crash game ever, and everyone knows who Jetix Magazine is. So immediately, I do have to give Tag Team Racing some credit. The story mode here is at least something different and not another random Alien. invasion. The plot here is that you're battling Cortex and accidentally stumble into a theme park built entirely for roller coasters and racetracks. Is that a wang? And you get roped into recovering the power sources for each of the theme park's lands that were mysteriously stolen from Von Clutch over here. But we're only helping him to do that because whoever does help him wins ownership of the entire park, which Cortex really wants to do, and we can't let him do that. So Tag Team Racing is yet another Crash Kart Racer, if you couldn't tell. It's CTR and Nitro Kart again, but with a million extra pointless mechanics, and in my opinion, it's even worse. The car controls are un- Bearably stiff, the track designs are the opposite of interesting, the shortcuts barely mean anything, the music is boring, the engaging and skill-based jumping drift to boost system has been totally removed and replaced with an awful power slide move that doesn't even help that much, but the worst thing about it to me, at least, is the main gimmick that separates this racer from the rest, the clashing system. In any race at any time, the character you pick can turn into a ghost and clonk their way into another car of your choosing to merge with them. And as we all know, nobody can clink the clonk 
Donk as good as Crash Bedinky Donk. By doing this, you briefly turn the game into Mario Kart Double Dash, but for war criminals, since you can swap between driving the car or aiming a weapon that has now attached itself onto the car in order to blow up everyone else until you run out of ammo. On paper, this sounds like the coolest addition ever. It's like Crash Team Racing meets Twisted Metal, especially since there's plenty of characters with unique weapons, there's loads of vehicle types with different defense speed and handling options, and plenty of unique visual combinations for certain carts clashing together. But all of this falls apart like soggy bread once you realise that you only need to clash with one car and then you've automatically won every single race. Engine. You see, Engine's weapon he has are these rockets, and they are so overpowered, I'm pretty sure they could be used in tactical warfare. With these rockets, you mow everybody down with no effort, one to two hits max with splash damage. And whenever you're gunning, the CPU in the driver's seat goes around the track as perfectly as possible. So just make sure you fire the rockets, detach from your host like a dying flea right before the end of the third lap because you get thrown forward every time you do detach, and then you'll find that you win every single time. When you're in this state, you are in complete control. You are a parasite. The helpless sap you attach to can't ever force you off. There's no time limit for this or penalty for overusing it. You can use overpowered race items in conjunction with the rockets. If you get blown up by other races, you recover two seconds later, still in the clash formation. And the best thing, if you run out of rockets, you can always detach and then immediately reattach again to get all of your ammo back. Sure, you can always switch driving positions and let the computer player shoot down the bogeys, but why would you do that when you can effortlessly get rid of the competition and not have to deal with the painfully un satisfying driving mechanics. You could always say that this is an optional mechanic, I suppose, I except it isn't, because if you don't clash with another car in any race, then you're a very weak target to every other car firing at you, and you explode so much as tumbleweed touches you. Not to mention, again, you're stuck with kart racing mechanics that feel like you're derailing a train, and other racers can attach themselves to you at random with as much consent as a wine steam. Basically, if you don't clash, you lose, so why wouldn't you choose to clash with the most powerful weaponed racer? And then, once you you unlock engine shortly into the game, it all becomes even easier since you don't even need to look for him in the race to grab his rockets. You can clash at the very start of the race to guarantee victory with any car without breaking a sweat. Look at these KOs. Look at these KOs. For a three lap race lasting around three minutes, this means I was averaging seven KOs per minute. And so at this point, why does the track design matter? Why do the visuals matter? Why do the shortcuts matter? For even a small fighting chance in tag team racing, you have to use this clash mechanic, which means you'll end up doing the same thing repeatedly to win every time. Even the other modes for each track have similar approaches to them. Oh, and did you know? This game is a platformer? Yeah, Tag Team Racing also has a giant hub world that's as much of a single game as the racing itself, despite being called Tag Team. And my god, look at this. Look at this performance. The game didn't run spectacularly in the races, but this here, this looks worse than my granddad's slippers. Couldn't you guys just focus on getting one gameplay style nailed instead of forcing as much in as possible? The jumping and general running around controls are so slippery and floaty, it's practically impossible to control where you're aiming towards. And even the spinning attack is lazy. See this? This isn't a death tornado spin power up from the other games. This isn't a super spin. This is just what happens when you hit square over and over again. The animation resets and you can keep spinning forever, meaning that no enemies will give you any trouble. No shits were given at all, my lumpies and germs. You also get interrupted a lot by Chick and Stu, who you may recognize from Nitro Fueled as the chickens who announce all the DLC Grand Prix. I hate them there, and I hate them even more here. Spend it like crazy on new stuff. Bling, bling. Bling, bling. Yeah, that's what all the kids were saying back then, wasn't it? Bling bling in my ding ding. To be totally fair to Tag Team though, despite not being that fun to control, I do admire a few things they do in this overworld system. Firstly, they turn the death animations Crash is famous for into an explorative gameplay mechanic, as you can go on a scavenger hunt looking for hidden specific death cutscenes that quite often got a chuckle out of me. Oh look, it's Flat Bandicoot. Secondly, these are some pretty expansive and densely designed hub worlds, especially on the vertical plane, and all the pockets of coins you find are able to purchase more outfits for your characters, more cars, and even a few crystals that you need in order to open the gates that will take you to the next power gem you need to progress to the next world. There's a reason to explore other than finding the next race, and I like that. You know what though, now that I think about it, the balance is a bit too skewed in the platforming's favour, because winning a race only rewards you with two crystals, whereas you're gonna be able to buy and find more hidden crystals in the overworld much faster in order to open up all these gates in the hub world to then find the hidden power gems and skip a huge chunk of the game without even doing a single race. Welcome to Crash Tag Team Racing. 
where we don't like racing. Overall though, tag team racing is an absolute mess, and in my opinion, one of the lowest points of Crash's console career. It tries to appeal to everyone, but ends up impressing no one. Half of it is Crash Team Racing, but with worse controls, worse performance, worse visuals, broken mechanics, and boring stale track design, while the other half is Twin Sanity, but with worse controls, worse performance, worse visuals, worse enemies, and barely any really challenging platforming. And hey, while we're on the subject of Disney, Uh, yeah, did you forget that Disney owned The Simpsons? I forget that at least once every two days. But I'll never forget the first time I played Simpsons skateboarding on the PS2. Yes, once again, I'm revisiting another game from the vaults of my old horrible reviews. Like a cockroach after a nuke, my past always comes back to make me itch. What's this? No memory card. Oh, what a shame. I guess that means I can't play the game anymore. So thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. I'll see you on the next Kanekura show, same time next week, where I'll be stomping on a kitten live on camera. Well, hey, look at that. The first thing I see in this game is something that makes absolutely no sense. And the sad thing is that this still makes more sense than anything else you're about to see. The intro to this game is quite simply hideous. One of the worst I've ever seen. It's just a barrage of colours and an onslaught of ugly edits enough to give you a seizure or make you feel like you're dying from leprosy. I mean, Look at this, come on. They couldn't even cut out the white in between Bart's armpit. And then after possibly the worst intro of all time, you get greeted to one of the worst opening themes of all time that either sounds like your CD is scratched or you're having convulsions. <laughs> After this, well, this screenshot here should tell you all you need to know about the level of quality we're dealing with. Marge looking like a squid, and Homer looking like a weak old can of spam. This is easily one of the ugliest PS2 games ever made from the starting gate, and then you actually get going and think to yourself, oh, you know, maybe I should try doing some tricks on the ground right now, like in every skateboarding game ever made, but oh no, you can't. Oh no! No joke, if you try to do something as simple as a kickflip, 75% of the time it won't work, and you'll be eating some grass-covered dindins instead. Once again, you've got to push yourself along with a forward push without automatic acceleration from holding down your ollie button, taking all the flow and momentum out of the gameplay, but I'd be able to get my head around this if the game let me push my board up slightly steep slopes, or let me get out of half-pipe bowls that I can't escape from. But you can't. This then compounds with an absolutely pathetic ollie that sometimes flies you up to space, and other times barely leaves the ground, meaning that you won't clear gaps, and sometimes you'll just accelerate from zero to piss off in half a second. Absolutely not nothing works in this game. It's actually a miracle how broken it is, as well as ugly. I mean, you look at that and tell me that's a person. That's not a person. It's a mound of beef. Don't forget the overly sensitive balance meter either. Or the fact that you have running commentary from your character and Kent Brockman throughout the entire game, and none of them ever shut up. Oh no! Kick flip. Ooh. Cup it. Whoa. Tail Bye. radical. Hey. Very well done. Ah. Well done. Sure, you could always argue that all these different characters have different stats that are better for different kinds of skateboarding tricks, but what <laughs> I'm gonna say in response to that is that Tony Hawk also has that system, but you're not absolutely incompetent at the start of the game. You can still do things, even if not as good as you will be able to later, but here, you can't do anything. I mean, look at this. Most of the time, you can't even grind anyway, and instead have the rail stick itself through your head. Personally, though, I didn't do much else because I decided to give up after I got decked in the head by a car. This is absolutely categorically definitive garbage. The Bubsy 3D of sports games, probably one of the worst ever made. Sure, Phoenix Games had this abomination five years after Simpsons skateboarding, but that's Phoenix Games. They probably put a blank disc into a sandwich toaster and then said, game's done. But considering this is The Simpsons and sold at a much higher price than a Phoenix game ever would, I'm shocked that no one seemed to care if this game even worked. I don't know how anybody in the dev team tested this and thought it was passable. It's borderline impossible to play. It's not even so bad, it's good. I don't feel any misguided passion or overinflated egos behind the creation of this, all I feel is the bitterness of an entire team who didn't want to make this. Considering it was aimed at kids as well who probably didn't know or care who a Tony Hawk was, it's probably the most cynical cash grab ever made for a licensed game. It copies the Tony Hawk level design, Tony Hawk game structure, Tony Hawk mission style, and even Tony Hawk button layout, but butchers every other element up so magnificently it makes me question why they didn't just do a full-blown rip-off of Tony Hawk entirely. Sure, it would have been unoriginal, but it would have been a good game. Look at this, if you even somehow manage to win a single thing in this game, all that satisfaction and frustration is spat back in your face as you only make 10 cents for it.
Are you telling me that I'm going through all of this toss for a grand prize of $99? Are you insane? I use that kind of money to blow my nose and wipe it on homeless people, and you're expecting me to nearly die for that? $99? Shred Springfield? With pleasure. Hello? Hello, Jim. Can I play Manhunt 2? Yes, you can. Thanks, Mum. Yep, here it is. Manhunt 2. Now we're getting into the really dodgy territory. The back of the box says it's an 18 for very strong, bloody, and sadistic violence, and it is not lying, because that is basically all this is. All you need to do is head for Wikipedia, search for Manhunt 2, and click on that tempting little controversy tab, and you'll see how much trouble this game had even before it was rumoured to be in development. Lawsuits, alleged links to murders, rejected ratings, four countries not accepting censored versions of the game at all, which are still banned to this day, and none other than Hillary Clinton writing a personal letter to the ESRB requesting the American rating be changed from mature to adult only. Gaming in the Clinton years indeed. Manhunt 2. The pervs redirects here. For other uses, see perv. So once again, just like the Punisher, what I'm holding here is the censored version of the 2007 original game. The original of which was then later released by Rockstar in 2009 on Halloween for PCs. And the UK and Ireland weren't allowed to sell it but I found a copy. And I played it. But to start with, the game gives you a tutorial section all about using your mouse to perform executions. And if these sounds are only a taste of what's about to happen... I desperately want to see the rest. For those of you too much of a whiny little bitch to find out yourself, Manhunt 2 is a stealth horror game with light combat elements, the funniest body carrying animation I've ever seen, and a lot, and I mean a lot of killing. My god, there's so much killing. And in toilets again, seems to be a running theme. But I'm clearly not very good at the killing because this guy just hung himself, yet his lifeless body still managed to knock me out. <laughs> you can kill people with basically anything. Syringes, <laughs> pocket knives, <laughs> Hammers, broken bottles, crowbars, shards of glass, baseball bats, fire axes, and someone's head. But I don't think this is why the game was banned all over the world. I reckon it's because we get to see the inside of your own body. Oh, hello there. Um, you're having a nice brown time. I'm gonna leave you to it. To call Manhunt 2 nothing but sadistic violence, though, is quite unfair because it's also horny. One of the first areas you explore is an S&M dungeon run by a man with a tuba for a head. And it even has a secret basement, a lot like the movie Hostel, with people torturing other people for sport. But if they like doing that so much, I guess they won't mind if I do it back to them. I mean, don't get me wrong, some of these executions are brutal. I was uncomfortable a few times, even. And the fact that you are actively rewarded more style points for charging your stealth attacks for even more savage kills is probably what rubbed people the wrong way back then. But come on, what's the point in killing anyone if you can't do it in style? And just like The Punisher, the PS2 version I have here is censored. But unlike The Punisher, it's censored in a much more aggressive way. Many executions and ways to kill are outright removed, and whenever you do activate an execution of any type, you get layers on top of layers of the ugliest filters and effects I've ever seen. Glitches, jitters, colour bleeding, blurring, caked onto the screen. It'll give you a headache. And to be honest, because you can't see what the hell is even going on, your imagination ends up doing most of the work, which makes these executions appear even more sadistic than the uncut version. I mean, if you walk up behind someone with a syringe to stab them with the syringe, how does censoring it change the fact I'm still stabbing someone with a syringe? This is all your fault, you scab! Skateboard madness on the PS2. Truly, this is a game for only the most mentally deranged of skateboarders. I mean, look at the madness going on here. Who is this man? And why is he tickling underneath his skateboard? And if there are any astute viewers of mine that have been around for many years, I'm sure that there's a logo on the box here that you recognize. If you see this logo, logo on any PS2 game, you run for the hills. You know how the angry video game nerd has his arch nemesis in LJN when it comes to atrocious game companies? Well, Phoenix Games are my personal LJN, and they have released some stonkers in the past, let me tell you. From Son of the Lion King to Dalmatians 3, all the way to Snow White and the Seven Clever Boys. They also made a game that didn't upset any minorities at all, and it was called Packet. And then they made Skateboard Madness, so let's check out what I'm getting myself into. My name is Let Me Out. And my character, 
has no name. Th that's a bit ominous. So I guess I'll just have to make them up myself. Should I be Jonathan? 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 Or Black Jonathan? I'm not even being insensitive when I say that. They all have exactly the same facial and body model. And you know what? I think I'll pick Jonathan. Let's kick things off nice and easily with a simple ollie. This bodes well. I just played a game with a jetpack mode, and even then, that game has more physics than this. What happens if you run into a rail? What happens if you jump on a rail? What happens if you jump up and try to do a 180 spin? What happens if you try to jump up a flight of stairs? What happens if you run dead straight into a wall? What happens if you go up a ramp? I mean, I suppose this does have its benefits sometimes, like when there's a big concrete bridge in your way. Don't worry, because Jonathan can go straight through it. The issue is, though, he can't do anything else. I have tried desperately to find more tricks than a heel flip and a kick flip, but I cannot for the life of me find any. On the other hand, though, I guess that doesn't even matter, because in a timed score counting match, landing kick flips doesn't even count towards giving you any points. Oh, well... Sometimes it does. Oh, and sometimes the game will say that you did three kickflips one after the other when you weren't even doing anything. <laughs> At least you weren't lying about this being mad. I will personally ship myself over to your house and give you a kiss if you can perform any tricks here and understand why they worked or how to do them again. Whenever I tap the grab button, I hold onto my board. Whenever I hold the grab button, I merely mm. tap my board. Occasionally, when I take a jump off of a quarter pipe, I won't stop spinning around in midair even though I'm not touching any directional buttons. And the amount of times that I go up a ramp only to just smack down off my board for no reason is almost comical. Then you remember you paid money for this and it's it's not funny anymore. I even tested the physics engine out by simply jumping off of a ramp, not touching anything and coming back down. This isn't a joke. Look, look. Come on, Jonathan. How useless could you possibly be? Don't make me get another Jonathan out. The only good thing I can point out with this game is the fact that whenever you bail, Jonathan doesn't rag doll or anything. He just turns stone dead and gives up, wondering how he got into this mess. So why don't we play Lego Soccer Mania on the PS2? Well, in this country, it's actually Lego Football Mania. But to be honest, that makes more sense to me anyway, because in football, you hit the ball with your foot. Oof, amazing, right? Soccer? Why do I Americans call it that? Is it because you have to wear socks? I suppose you don't even call this basketball. I bet you call it Spankle. Now, since I couldn't care any less about football, I don't care enough to think of a clever name, so I'm Ooh! And amazingly enough, this game has a story mode. Didn't see that one coming, but I'm all over it. Wait, is that pepperoni with a stubble? All right, okay, gotta pick my team now and all of my main characters. Gotcha. Uh, Harry Flash. Well, he's certainly flashing something, but it's not for ages 6 to 99. I think my main character will be Nigel Nutmeg, because that is the greatest name of all time. Do you know how long it takes for this game to load one match? I'll tell you. 54 seconds. I know that doesn't sound like much, but the longest loading times in Wrath of Cortex take you around 30 seconds. So imagine sitting through this twice, and then instead of getting a decent platforming stage waiting for you, it's this instead. Yeah, compared to some of the PS1 games we've looked at, this doesn't look so hot, especially for a generation jump up. This game looks like it smells of cheese. I look at all of this and I swear I can taste deodorant on top of BO. Which might be negative past association with school locker rooms after we were forced to play football. But still, the game looks like melting plastic cheese that was left on the side for three years. I feel sticky just being near it and I want to cry. We start the game itself with a good old kickoff and... Well, it's football, all right. Maybe it's because I know nothing about football and really couldn't care less, but this seems pretty lacking to me. You can pass, you can shoot, you can tackle, you can switch positions. It's functional, but drab as hell. Look at the cheeseman go very slowly. It's not made any better either by the stock music and absolutely zero transitions or sound effects for when special events happen. Or even when you use power-ups. Oh, oh yeah, this game has power-ups. You can bomb your teammates whenever you want, and the best thing is that you won't get a strike for it. Wait, that's, that's not football, is it? Look, I know so little about this sport that after half-time happened, I didn't realise we swapped goals around, and I was confused why nobody was trying to stop me as I darted towards my own goalie. He was just as confused as I was. But even as someone with the most minimal knowledge available about football, I still managed to win a match 4-0, so that's the level of basic we're talking about with this game. Overall, LEGO Football Mania is just like real football. It except without a sweaty fat man spitting in your drink. 2006, everyone was sick of the poor batting average of cheeky platforming Kiddie Spyro, so then they hit the reset button and started a brand new trilogy known as The Legend of Spyro, starting off with the appropriately titled A New Beginning, or as it's more commonly known, The Legend of Simon, A Nice 
Bailiff. This was made by Chrome Studios this time, and I have never played this game before, so do you want to know what I think? It's different, so it stinks. So now we're not a baby game anymore. We're going darker and way more serious. I mean, it worked so well with a three-foot hedgehog. Why can't it work with a bright purple three-foot dragon? We're dealing with the origins of Spyro from his egg hatching to learning the truth about his past. And there's an innocent dragon cursed by a dark master, but we don't realize that until we need to kill her. And all sorts is going on. We aren't in a cartoon anymore, Sunshine. We're now in Lord of the Rings. And so who better to get involved in this game than with the Lord of the Ring himself, Elijah Wood, providing the voice of Simon for the very first time, alongside the voice of Gary Oldman. And I will say this right now, Elijah gives us the best delivery of the no cliche I think I've ever seen. No! Oh, and who wants to see the newest Sparks? Catch up or give up, Chunky. Right, so we've gone from a collectathon platformer to side-scrolling minigamer to action RPG. So logically, we've made the next step to an action-adventure beat-em-up. But now Sparks looks like a DreamWorks ant and Spyro looks like a drunk. And I will say right now, I don't hate this game but I don't like it that much either. I promise all of you I'm going into this with as open of a mind as I can, but I don't know, guys. The basics are here and they're playable, but there's so many catches and snags I can't get around. Stuff like the upgrade points, not having any on-screen indication how much you have, so you have to keep pausing and looking in the upgrade menu to check yourself. I find that the moves are way too slow to come out for how fast the enemies move around you. If you're stuck and surrounded in a group, there's no way to quickly dodge out of it. And yet, you can dodge with this weirdly sluggish strafe move, but you aren't going to dash away to safety anytime soon by doing this. Not to mention there's no lock on, so you can't even choose what target to swap around while you do the strafing. And no matter what you do, you will eventually be overwhelmed by enemies called Fisty Grin Thief. Not that it's a big deal though, because if you die, nothing happens. You just carry on from a few seconds ago. Okay then. Honestly, I just prefer spamming firebombs. It's easily the most effective and powerful attack to deal with all the groups, and it can also make the game look like spreaded mustard. You can double jump and you can glide, which I do appreciate, but there's barely any real point to it. You're still majorly railroaded from samey combat encounter to samey combat encounter without really being able to explore anything. Secrets aren't really a thing anymore either. The focus here is definitely the combat, but the issue is this ain't no Devil May Cry or Bayonetta. It's stupidly basic. Even the different elements mental breath attacks don't change the fact that you're still pressing variations of the same three buttons without much else going on. And I know a ton of people wanted me to go in depth here and were really hyped to see what I thought about a nearly 20 year old reboot about a lizard, but here's the thing. I can fill the video with empty fluff and just talk your ears off lying about how much I can talk about if you want me to, or I can be honest. And honestly, this isn't doing it for me. It's just too bland. I've got nothing to say about it. It's not as awful as everyone around me at the time made me think, but it is a little bit... Meh. Now, I don't mind the new direction here at all, but my issue with it is that A, it's not done that well to begin with, and I could be playing any other hack and slash or beat em up that's already better out the gate, and B, it's still Spyro. This isn't what I wanted to play a Spyro game for. It would be like if you made Crash Bandicoot the star of. Seven Sins. Knock, knock, open up the door. Hello, Caddy. Oh, shit. Shave my back! It's my evil twin brother, Baddy! I bought something for you. Oh, for me. You should have. I deserve it. <laughs> you know, I'm starting to think that Baddy isn't actually all that bad. I mean, you know, after... <laughs> I mean, after all, who goes out of their way to gift you a jigsaw puzzle? I wonder what's on... God, I can't believe it. It's me, and that means they made another Spyro game. Spyro, enter the dragonfly. No thanks. So after Insomniac Games left the franchise behind for Ratchet and Clank, we've now got Check 6 and Equinox teaming up to push this one out on the GameCube and PS2. As for the Xbox, and after they made Enter the Dragonfly, the reviews were so great, they closed down forever. Before anything else, I want to direct you to the demo screen of this game after you leave the start menu running a while, and you are going to watch it with me in its entirety. Ooh, these are nice flowers. Who am I going to pick for this save game then? Ooh. <laughs> so the game begins and we get our first cutscene. Wow! 
Yeah, this looks good. Nothing to see here. It all looks top form. This is exactly like an interactive electronic video game. Also, this cutscene cacks. It goes on forever and it really has no right to. Do you want me to paraphrase exactly what happens in this entire cutscene? Wow, isn't everything great? Hello, my Gs. Oh no, it's Ripto. What are you doing here? That's a good question. Yeah, it is a good question. What are we doing here? What do you mean, what are we doing here? If you ask me one more question, I'm going to skin you. Now, where was I? Oh yes, that's a good question. I'm here because I- Yeah, that is more or less exactly how this cutscene plays out. It's just a massive one-sided conversation with Ripto and absolutely nobody else while they all just stand there and let him steal all of these baby dragonflies. You all deserve to lose everything you care about and watch all that you love turn to dust. After that, we all get an uncomfortable look into Bianca's flesh mouth and then off we go to save the dragonflies. Or else... Or else the other dragons won't be able to use them as human shields. And they have all sorts of cute names like... Bonky. Hey, it's Fluffy. That's weird, because dragonflies aren't Fluffy. <laughs> hey, it's Sandra. It's Sam. Oh, my spoiled custard. Is this, is this how the game runs? Is the whole game going to run like this? Well, then someone had better catch it then. Come on, Simon, exit my dartboard. Why are you like this? Are you dying? Oh, no, there's an ice gate that can only be opened by ice breath. Yeah, all right. So here's the thing. Collecting the dragonflies is the main mission in this game, but it is much easier to do than you think because, yeah, the game is broken. Nah, it's not just broken. It's been shattered into a thousand pieces. Infamously, you can even finish the entire game in less than 10 minutes by swimming through a hole in a net, flying over to the center of the hub world, and then pissing straight into the final boss portal. Now, many years ago, I made a dedicated video about Enter the Dragonfly, and I was a puss. I didn't actually bother playing the game, I just broke it, finished it in 10 minutes, and then shoved out a lazy joke video to cover my electric bill, but this time, no such excuses. I played it legit, from start to end. So now I can confidently say, without a doubt, the game is still shat. And I'm not the only one that thinks that, right Lady Emily? Spyro, I mean... I, I enjoyed Enter the Dragonfly as a kid. <laughs> Shut I, I, up! I mean, ostensibly, the game is the same as Spyro 1, 2, and 3, but instead of refining or going forward, it takes things away. Simon 1 had six hub worlds, Simon 2 had three, Simon 3 had four, and this game has one. One hub world. And not only that, it also has eight levels. Eight levels in total. Simon 3 had 21 Simons and Dartboard only has eight. Sure, they are much bigger than previously and they do things like putting speedway courses inside those levels to beef up a single level instead of split them up. But it also means that there isn't as much visual variety, way too many flat and gaping chasms of spaces where a level should be, barely any gliding challenges aside from like three levels, and despite you having new power-ups to unlock in the forms of different elemental breaths, which is an idea I do love, there is only one single instance of returning to an older level to find something new with an unlocked breath, and all it involves you doing is grabbing kites by standing on children's heads. This also means the music is pretty limited in comparison to the PS1 games too, and I'm not sure why, but despite it being the same composer, it sounds like it's falling asleep most of the time. I don't think the music's bad necessarily, it's just too atmospheric and rich for its own good, especially for a game that looks like this. Can't deny though, Cloud9 is a tune. Not to mention the game is insultingly easy. I breezed through most of it without even thinking about it. Check out this mission from the halfway point of the game. Great! Hey, it's Takahiro! And of course, I'm sure you've all noticed by now, the lag. Now, I can handle a bit of lag, that's not a problem, but what I can't handle is when the lag starts making things run in slow motion. Because when things start running in slow motion, I can't even tell anymore if I'm jumping or giving birth! No, don't worry, your video is not buffering or dropping frames, and you don't have cataracts. This is how the game looks, all the time. It never stops. I almost want to get a cheerleading squad in there to encourage it to run properly, and on many occasions it gets so close, but just can't quite get there. Come on, Simon! You can do it! You can do it! You can do- Oh! 
And in some of the Speedway missions and tank battles, it goes beyond PowerPoint presentation slides. It's like looking at a newspaper. It's a necessary evil though, team, because we need to include the fog. And... Grass physics. If there was ever a game I wanted to dive under the hood of and see what the hell is going on with it, it would be Enter the Dragonfly. So I got my mate Boundary Break to look into the inner workings of the game, and this is what he found. Oh god! Wow, how did the developers leave that in? And even if the game didn't run like a crusty pair of jeans, the whole thing still feels like it's underwater. Movement is so slow and extremely floaty. The gems take three years to hit the ground after you break them out of baskets. And oh man, oh geez, are you a go? I don't mind the general graphics and the level aesthetic. Sometimes it can be quite nice. But what is it with these mouth animations? Is your face trying to run away from itself? You can't just take the low poly PS1 toasty maker mouths and then smooth them out for the PS2. It was charming back in 1999, but in 2002, it all looks like a pair of old socks. <laughs> and on top of all of that, as you could quite clearly see earlier, the game isn't finished. Spyro. And I'm not talking about the gameplay removals either. Technically, it's a disaster as well. Have you ever played a game where there's a loading screen? To load a loading screen. Spyro has no drop shadow, making gliding a total pain in the sphinct. Enemies don't attack you. Spyro gives up walking and just floats everywhere. The progression atlas disappears and turns black. Spyro gets stuck in ladders. Charging decides to stop working entirely. Sound effects disappear at random. <laughs> The wing deflect move you unlock, aside from only being needed for one single part of the game, doesn't even make its target when you do need it. Spyro loves to do these random falling animations after charge jumps and completely stop you in your tracks midair. The milk breath you get from space candy has no range. What? The camera controls often stop working entirely whenever you move. The camera forgets that it's supposed to be looking at you all the time. Sparks just refuses to eat butterflies when he desperately needs them for extra hit points. The Spitfire machine gun needs to be tapped over and over again to fire instead of just held down. Your flame breath sometimes doesn't attack at all. The characters are always turning into statues, especially during dialogue. Uh-oh, he stopped. C can someone put a pound in him? Then there's my favourite one. Whenever you're in the tank, you're able to twist the turret with the shoulder buttons whenever you're stationary. But then when you start moving, you're allowed to twist the turret left, but then twisting it right stops working. Only when you're moving. This game is incredible. And taking the coding issues out of the way and the gameplay being stripped back from the PS1 days, the game's also unfinished in other weird ways, like with good old Rage Against the Machine Bag, who only appears one single time in the entire game on on level one and never comes back. Which is probably for the best because I don't like your cultural appropriation. And there's this bit where you talk to a monkey, finish a sliding mission, get a dragonfly, and then the game makers forgot to make the monkey offer you an extra dragonfly for doing the mission again on hard mode. So Sparks just turns around to you and says, oh, wait a second, there's another dragonfly mission here, but the monkey forgot to tell you about it. So do you want to do the slide again? Oh, and speaking of Sparks, most of the time he has the same voice in Spyro 3 that I love dearly. <laughs> Except for one single instance when Spyro insults him and he outright just says the word Hi. You can look up reviews of this game when it first came out on the internet, but honestly, I don't think it's possible to review this game. They're all just encyclopedias of everything wrong with it. Hey, it's Shadow. So when all is said and done and you can't stomach it any longer, you end up at the final boss, Ripto. Oh, no, wait. I meant the only boss, Ripto. What is this game's daddy issues? And the boss itself is... Well, it's on brand, I'll give it that. <laughs> also worth mentioning that if you start this fight off, you have bricked your save file and can never leave the fight until you beat the game. So if you're going for 100%, do not go into the boss portal. You'll never come back. The fight itself is pretty... Meh, but the best thing about it is that after you beat him, you get this cutscene. Yes. Enter the Dragonfly genuinely feels like a load of people got together in a meeting. One person came in and said, Hey guys, I've got eight new Spyro level ideas. And the rest of the team said, thank you. That is all. It is sadly the first of quite a few Spyro games that doesn't make me go. <laughs> in fact, the game is so bad, I don't even think any children's TV presenters on CBBC would take a paycheck to advertise it to kids, would they, Chris Johnson? Oh, they'll buy anything. CBBC has been showing the exact same episode of Tracy Beaker on a loop for years and none of them have noticed. <laughs> Little pricks. 
So that's why you don't present CBBC anymore. The only major drops of praise I can give this game are that it gives you the ability to warp to any level right from the pause menu once you've already visited it. The sliding missions are admittedly a lot more fun than Spyro 3, and above all, at least it isn't racist. Diggy diggy unga boom! Ha <laughs> diggy diggy lolo. Oh. Okay. By the way, guys, you can keep your trouble with the trolley, eh? Shit. The one phrase I had to hear at least six goddamn times over was Defend the Puffy Palace? This dog fight is dog bad. The enemy planes can drain your health in seconds, they're too hard to hit, there's no aiming reticle, and the battleships take at least a thousand missiles to take down. And after every 30 seconds of each failed attempt, I got thrown back to the goddamn Defend the Puffy Palace? The only way I could win this mission is by giving the battleships a good old ram over and over again while spamming the ever-loving hell out of the missile button. Because that's fun, isn't it? Actually, yes it is. Especially if it means avoiding Defend the Puffy Palace. Luke, that wasn't even close. <laughs> You're an embarrassment. No! The most annoying thing about Exit My Dartboard, though, is that the base is definitely there. I can see a started game. I can see a natural extension from PS1 Spyro to PS2 Spyro. It's extremely close to being a competent, simple, yet effective bit of comfort food, like a peanut butter sandwich. Except it's a peanut butter sandwich that has the bread, but replace the peanut butter with more bread. That's what this is. Spyro 4 is a bread sandwich. Oh, and who in Satan's pantry signed off on this credits image? I mean, I like it, it's funny. Wait a second, is your name Two-Eyed Willy? The thing is though, I didn't just decide to play every level and beat the game. I decided to beat it all. I completed this game 100%. I got everything. I did everything just for the chance of having an extra cool hidden bonus ending thing just like in all the other three Spyro games. And what did I get here? I got a secret ending cutscene. And what was it? Well, everything is finally back to normal. Isn't it Spyro? Spyro Enter the Dragonfly makes me want to piss the bed. So how about we take a look at another game that was deemed so controversial it never even made it to the UK. Like the guy game. This is... This is no. Why, hello there ladies. You look... Clean. Hang on, this is the guy game. Where's the men? The guy game is a game all about answering trivia questions. Yeah, you didn't see that coming, did you? Look, just because guys may be slobbering lust monsters doesn't mean we aren't smart, and the guy game is here to truly test your knowledge in all the right ways. With boob! The guy game is what happens when a load of morons go to spring break with a few cameras, a few microphones, and then coax a load of bimbos that stink of regret into playing a game where if they get an answer to a trivia question wrong, they suffer the indignity of exposing themselves to a man-sized ferret. But don't worry, if you get a question wrong, you don't need to expose anything. Well, you could have told me earlier! The guy game is aimed squarely at testosterone-laden college students, spring breakers, and, well, any red-blooded American guy. This is a man's game for grown-up manly many men manly men. Couldn't you tell from this manly face on the front cover? Doesn't that get you in the mood to see some girls? You bring the party and we'll supply the game. You'll score every time. Oh yeah, I feel like I'm really scoring right now. Alone, in the dark, in my pants, playing PlayStation 2. How's your game? Well, I'm playing a video game instead of seeing real women, so my game is just dandy. I don't know about you lot, but I can't wait to see the assets of Press, VP, Tress, and A-Hole. So let's boot the game up. <laughs> After everything we've seen so far, even the word loading is nasty. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm having a right load. Here's the intro FMV cutscene, letting us know what the hell we're getting ourselves into. Oh god, please no. Please don't tell me that this game has commentary. From this hog. Well, I think it would be downright rude to start the game without meeting the babes first, so let's check out some of the people we'll be looking at today. Ramona. What do you look for in a man? His jugular vein. Okay! Zoe, ultimate dream? To be able to jog without pain. Now, now that's a woman we can all aspire to be. Simone, I lost my virginity, but I still have the box it came in. Awesome, can you ship it over to me? Oh, wow! I didn't know that Ronald Reagan was a double D cup. Unfortunately though, this is probably the best of the talent we're gonna be seeing because the rest of the women here- I'm attracted to short guys because they like me. What do you look for in a man? 
tall. Aren't very bright. Uh, maybe I'm being too harsh. So let's go to the behind the scenes photos and see if there's any more intelligent people lurking in there. Ha! My name is... Sticky, and to start with, we only have one episode, but that's not a big deal. Uh, oh, okay, we also need a profile name, and <laughs> Big Daddy was the default, so I'm gonna change it only a tiny bit. Perfect. The rules of this trivia game are very simple. Don't bother getting any questions right because it doesn't matter. Instead, if you want to get anywhere in this game and unlock further episodes, that's entirely down to how well you can randomly guess if the brazen hussy you're talking to will be able to get the same question right or wrong. Or if you're feeling extra dangerous, you'll need to guess what wrong answer they will give in the special round of tit wits. If you guess wrong too many times, this woman appears and berates you. What's wrong with you? Don't you want to see titties? But the more times you guess correctly, the more you add to the patented Flashometer. Level 1 is soft and squishy where everything gets censored with a guy game logo, meaning some poor soul had to keyframe animate this logo on top of every single woman. Luckily, I don't mind boobs, but the guy game logo? <laughs> <laughs> Level 2 is sorta of chubby, which if I ever hear a dong described as that again, I'll cut it off. And that's when the women end up going from logo censoring to pixelation. Mmm. Squares! Capping this off is level 3, super stiff, where the censoring is totally gone. Oh, and by the way, every time you move the flashometer along, it comes. If all of this gets a little bit too much, you know, like, if you can't handle the unbridled sexiness going on, it's okay, because you can quit the game whenever you want with the hottie bagger. <laughs> this game is terrible! A quiz game is nothing without a good host, though, and the guy game doesn't disappoint with Matt Sadler. I'm trying to be an RN. Training to be an RN, a nurse. Yeah, no, how about you? Same thing. <laughs> I'm picturing the two of you in nurses' outfits as we speak, so it's great. Awesome. He's delightful. Although, our side commentator, Stephen Dick. A college student who's working as a waitress. When you ask her for food, she brings it to you. I'll definitely a close second. Okay, I'll do my best not to give you a hard one. <laughs> but I gotta tell you, I got a hard one. Mm. Stephanie is now causing problems with my shorts. If anything, I think there's only one missing piece that would complete this puzzle and make the game perfect. PS2 buzz controllers. One, two, three! Which is the birthplace of the King of Pants? Oh, and by the way, when I started this match, I made sure the balls were turned on. So yeah. When can we see the mat? And at this point, I don't even know if the flashometer is how uncensored you're able to make the game or how much blood you're able to add to Matt Sadler's face because the further you get, he just gets redder and redder. He's like a ripening little strawberry. He looks like he's about to burst. Has he not seen a woman before? You want to know the sleaziest part of all of this, though? This red-faced pomegranate getting all worked up and sweaty, gawking over all of these 18-year-old college women is 32. And just so I'm clear, the age gap isn't the problem. I just find it really funny to think that this guy has had such bad luck with women for over a decade of his adult life that the only way he's able to see jugs is by setting up a PS2 trivia game with questions about Miles Davis, Monopoly, Particle Science and Star Trek. He knows these ladies are gonna get them all wrong. He knows that means he'll see them all. And he loves it. Or maybe he doesn't because at the end of it he only ends up a semi-flaccid. I'm on a mission in this round. Uh-oh. I'm gonna see him. Hey, you wanna know what really gets me going? Schindler's List. Oh look, it's a game about throwing balls into a load of targets for four minutes straight. You know, what every hot-blooded American guy loves to do in the middle of their happy time. If I ever match with somebody on Tinder, I want to see if they can score more than 402,000 on bulls shots. I want to know they're worthy enough for my body. Uh, elephant eggs are really big. Okay, so these women may be thick, but at the very least, they were all here of their own consent and were all of perfectly legal age. 19, 20, 23, 20, 20, 19, 17. Yeah! So as it turns out, this game was not only never released anywhere else in the world other than the States for its content, but it was eventually taken off the shelves entirely because one girl in one of the very final episodes of the game was allegedly under legal age when she decided to throw herself on camera. I am holding a disc that contains... The last time I played LEGO Racers 2 was about 15 years ago. Sure, I remember loving this game as a kid, I put hours into it. But this advanced PS2 sequel, I haven't touched since then. And I've replayed the original LEGO Racers loads of times.
That's not a good sign, is it? Ever since I made my LEGO Racers 1 video back in 2012, I had so many of my viewers from back then desperately ask me to play LEGO Racers 2. And so I'm honouring that request right now, eight years later. So if you were 90 years old and were asking me to cover this game back then, I'm sorry that I'm talking about it now that you're dead. The game opens up with a cinematic showing us Rocket Racer, the big main final boss of the first game, trying to deal with his humiliating defeat against us at the end of that game. He hears about a galaxy-wide championship, jumps back in his car, goes through a portal, and picks up a load of these weird, tiny little Lego Racers characters which I remember having a few of when I was a kid. And after all of that, that somehow means he's the best racer of all time again, and we need to beat him again. Okay. What is my name this time? Hello. I'm Carp. It's time for us to build a character again, and unfortunately, we have a lot less pieces to choose from compared to the first game, but that doesn't mean I still can't pick the worst choices from every category, and I hereby dub this creation Pneumonia Nakey. Time for us to build a car, and luckily, I've learnt more than enough from my car building in LEGO Racers 1, so this time I can make this car the best it can possibly be. The beginning of the gameplay itself starts off pretty quaint as you're plonked onto a little island and are challenged with racing all of the local workforce, wasting all of the taxpayers' money with racing tournaments and spending the rest on diggers that can drive at 90 miles an hour. Also, yeah, sorry about these weird black lines on the screen during the cutscenes here, but this is because I'm fast forwarding them manually during the gameplay since you can't skip them, even though I really wish you could, because boy do they drag on and on, even when you speed them up. Plus, speeding up everything leads to scenes like this. Am I about to be sacrificed? Target one, the construction worker. And this is a pretty easy race, but then again, if you're in a racing game and lose to a digger, you shouldn't be playing it. Target two, the postman, who boasts that he knows the island inside out better than anybody, but that doesn't matter because we have to go through specified checkpoints that we are given arrows that point towards them, so all of that knowledge means nothing. Target three, the fireman, who... Target four, the policeman. And to be honest, Mr. Copper, if you can't keep up with somebody that's driving a car with no way to look out the front of it, you shouldn't be a policeman. After you've done all of these races, you're then whisked off to the first world of the game, where you then get your standard six-player races until you reach a boss racer at the end. Similar to how LEGO Racers 1 handled it, but with just every race being individual instead of one after the other in a single Grand Prix. This isn't all you get to do, though. You see, LEGO Racers 2 pushes the PS2 hardware to overdrive, since there are no race selection menus to navigate. All the race choosing and world travelling is done within an open world, much like in LEGO Island. Within these worlds aren't just the races, but also secret golden bricks to find that unlock more worlds later on, hidden mission tornadoes that give you a mini game to complete for an upgrade to your car's speed, grip or shield, and many other secrets and surprises. But the cost of this is the fact that the game itself couldn't seem to fit any other original racetracks onto the disc alongside these worlds, and so everything you do in each world takes place in exactly the same location. And that's not all, every single hub world uses the same song, every single mini game uses the same song, and every single race only uses one song per world. Not to mention they're all taking place on the same island and all feel exactly the same to race on. The only major thing that changes in the races is the weather, but Christ almighty, if you're gonna tell me that changing the colour of the sky constitutes a totally new and original racetrack, then I suppose you won't mind taking a sip of my new yellow water. From world to world, it's all the same story. You explore and race around exactly the same locations, along the same routes, with repeated music over and over again, meaning that despite the game featuring five worlds with four to five races each in them, in actuality it feels more like five races in total in the entire game because each race in every world feels exactly the same. Unless, of course, you count the final race against Rocket Racer, but that track is just one big circle, so it's a big load of piss. This issue is then compounded with the removal of the unique, clever, and very LEGO-oriented brick stacking power-up system from LEGO Racers 1, instead opting for just a small handful of power-ups that barely have any impact, aren't very imaginative, and have no strategic angle to grabbing and using them. So, in essence, LEGO Racers 2 is weaker than the first game in practically every way, except visually. And even then, for a PS2 game, it still doesn't have four-player co-op. There's no defense for that, because the first one should have had it in the first place. What is this game's problem? Well, at least it has some glitches. Actually, I say the game looks better, but that's a lie most of the time too, because when there's more than two cars on the same screen, the game itself sucks its own farts and leaves the building. Something that is maybe even more terrible than the performance of the game though is the performance of your wheels. The grip your car has against any terrain, whether it's dry as a bone or wet as a tongue, is absolutely horrendous. What is this game? Lego Racers 2?
much grease. And with how brutal the other races are on the tracks, any single mistake on a race often means you've lost immediately and just need to restart. That being said, I do like a few things in this sequel. Firstly, in keeping true to its Lego roots, whenever you get hit by a weapon or drive too fast into a corner, you lose a few specific bricks from your car that you built. And whenever you drive through a rebuild gateway, all of your car specific bricks that you lost are magically clicked back onto your car, meaning that for any car you make, you get unique rebuilding animations and unique destruction animations during the race that leaves your own car in different stages of destruction based on the bricks that you used yourself. I know I'm over explaining it, but there's not much else going on in this game, so I'm trying to make it sound exciting. Oh, you can also give yourself a tiny little boost if you accidentally knock your own bricks off. It's not very impressive. Oh, and if you end up damaging yourself too much, your entire car can be destroyed until you find the next rebuilding gate, meaning that you then have to race while running around as a little minifigure. You can't use any power-ups and you're really slow, so this isn't a good thing, but how cool is this for a game about breakable Lego cars racing each other? In conclusion though, this game is a pretty piss poor sequel in my opinion. It's got some great ideas and good scope, but it's way too samey, way too monotonous, and look at this, kids aren't gonna be able to stomach this. They're gonna wanna put the game away and go straight back to their Lego Elsas and Lego Bananas. I mean, even the building kind of sucks. Look at it. Instead of being based on what bricks you can fit on what part of the car, here, it doesn't matter because you're stuck with a limited number of bricks to use at all times. It's probably because of the destruction system, but what kind of brick a brack is that? Everybody knows that the more bricks you can mount together, the better it feels. Airblade may just be the game for you. A forgotten little ditty on the PS2 released in 2001 and made by the same people who did the Burnout game. So as you can see, See, they're very good at making games with wheels. Which is why in Airblade, you're playing a game that has no wheels. The simplest way I can describe Airblade is to take the time limit mission objective open-ended style of the Tony Hawk series and swap a plank of wood for a hoverboard. Yes, a hoverboard. And as ridiculous as Tony Hawk on a hoverboard sounds, for the most part, I feel like Airblade completely nails what it sets out to do. In fact, dare I say it's a... <coughs> A hidden game. Look, it even has a story mode with cutscenes. This is our main character, Ethan. He sounds like this. Oscar hijacked the stick? No wonder the suits are so buff. And because of that, I hate him. He also dresses like a traffic light. So the plot here is that Ethan's house is being raided by the government because of a strange package that his... Roommate? Grandpa? friend with benefits received. Nobody knows what it is or why it's so important, but that obviously means we need to take it immediately without thinking about it and go on the run to become a fugitive. Oh. <laughs> That was great. As it turns out, this secret package was actually a hoverboard, which Ethan magically knows how to use straight away, and then holy shit, you're able to do basically anything on it within 15 seconds of picking it up. Ethan is my kind of guy. My first time on a hoverboard was nothing like this. Like I said earlier, Airblade is basically Tony Hawk in terms of its arcade mission-based structure and time limit, except here, it's way more linear. You get story-based missions that need to be completed one after the other, and completing each one increases your total time limit. To do these missions, it usually means initiating a sequence of tricks around the environment and pedestrians, or sometimes exploring the open-ended levels from top to bottom to find the correct thing to grab or grind across to reach higher places. The story mode itself is laughably tiny, and the cutscenes are admittedly awful, but I'll be damned, this is one of the smoothest running and satisfying skating games I've ever played. It takes a while to get the hang of it, but once you do, it feels as natural as breathing, and you're able to do some crazy flippy floppy Kingdom Hearts shit unheard of in other skating games. Up here on the screen is your boost meter, which I suppose you could also say is is your fuel. It doesn't stop you from moving if it runs out, don't worry, but this boost meter is needed to not only speed up around the level and give yourself more air up ramps, but is also used up by pressing and holding the jump button to give you a small hover and glide depending on how much boost you have. These two abilities, especially for the timed missions, are vital, so how do you get more boosts? Well, you do more tricks, of course, and where linking them together during one large mid-air combo spinning around poles and landing on rails is preferable, emergency boost fuel can be given to you by simply hitting the flip trick button, because I don't know if you noticed, but you float, meaning that you can do unlimited flip tricks without bailing, which is also used for attacking enemies. Airblade is far from amazing, but colour me impressed because this is the most original arcade skating game I've ever played. It controls fantastically, looks great for a 2001 PS2 game, runs as smooth as butter, and yeah, the music isn't amazing either, I mean one track sounds like someone left the kettle on. <laughs> 
but I would say this is certainly a diamond in the rough. So here we go, Ant's Extreme Racing for the PS2. Don't ask me how he got into Extreme Racing, I think it might have been the crack. Okay, so this is the best idea for a race I've ever heard. You take a movie not necessarily made for kids, all about communism, propaganda, individuality, the politics of war, and exploitation of the working class with the benefit of the self-proclaimed strongest, and then turn it into a car racer for toddlers. Now you may think that three pounds isn't that much for a PS2 racing game based on the movie Ants, but this is actually the most I paid for any of the games in this video so far, so my expectations are through the roof. Just gonna open up the case and, oh well. That's just lovely. Whoever owned this before me really likes ants. And it's also reassuring to know that we're playing a classic from Lisp Games. Lisp, because our standards strive for excellence. Okay, I know I jest, but you know what? I actually think this is the best game we have so far. I'm stunned, or should I say, Stung. As ridiculous as the idea of a kart racer based on the Ants movie is, I'm shocked at how good this game is for a kart racer that was universally hated when it came out. I mean, sure, everything else around the gameplay sucks a little bit, like the bland menus, barely any voice acting, and terrible soundtrack that doesn't fit with anything going on on the screen. <laughs> Gets me in the mood for Woody Allen. But the rest of it, I really think is well done. You've got multiple vehicle types for races, allowing you to drive, climb, board, run, or fly. Great controls for all of those types that all feel different from each other. You get really great tracks with creative obstacles and plenty of shortcuts. You get kick-ass power-ups like the oh-so-satisfying boost. <laughs> You get some really damn good graphics for a 2002 PS2 game. I mean, look at these character models. And if you get hit, the responsive and zippy control style even allows you to correct the spin out. This is a good game we have here. What's up with you, Metacritic? You got ants in your pants? Check out the level of detail even. All the cars are being powered by slave insects, which is very sad actually, but also so cool. And all the wheels are made from shirt buttons and eraser heads. There's a gag at the end of every race too, showing you what position you came against every other ant in your colony. Basically, if you can get your head around how stupid the idea of a Sylvester Stallone and Christopher Walken kart racing game is, I really think you might like this one. A three lap driving race in the rain. Careful now. I can't really make any jokes about this one. It's a solid racing game, so I guess I'll save my progress and come back to it some other time. And my name is... Funty. But don't fret! I mean, did you like Crash Team Racing? Yeah? Good? Well, have I got the steal for you? Because for the low, low price of... Three, you can get Crash Team Racing, but on the PS2 with better graphics, and you fall through the floor all the time! Oh yes, sign me up. Banuka boy. So Crash Nitro Kart was sort of a sequel slash spiritual successor to Crash Team Racing for the PS2 era, and oh boy does it feel like a game stuck in the shadow of its better big brother that the parents love more. In many ways this is just a carbon copy of Crash Team Racing, but just not as good. It's even apparent in the adventure mode. The plot of CTR is aliens, and the plot of Nitro Kart is aliens, but instead of Oxide threatening to turn Earth into a giant concrete parking lot, you have this guy called Velo who just steals you to race a bunch of times to entertain other aliens on another planet. That's basically it. And his beard is the shape of the first letter of his name. Nitro Kart does actually give you a good first impression. Instead of making you pick one character only for the entire adventure, like in CTR, you get to pick from either Team Bandicoot or Team Cortex, allowing you to swap between three different characters with their own unique driving styles and kart stats whenever you want to in between all of the races. And that's not all. You even get unique cutscenes for each team throughout the story mode based on who you pick. But then you realise that they didn't bother to fix the facial animations for the masks. You will have to race in order to to win the galaxy circuit and save Earth for us to conquer. What's my name? Easy. Sloppy. Because that's what this game is. And that's a massive shame to me, because as far as pushing the Crash Kart racing games forward goes, Nitro Kart gave us a fair amount new and good. This was the game that introduced a new boost formula where the closer you leave the drift meter to the burnout, the faster boost you're rewarded with. A brilliant risk and reward system that they later brought back for Nitro Fuel. They gave us unique track designs with trap crates to break that activate different obstacles on the track to sabotage other players. There are some great new items like the tornado that picks up anybody it touches and goes around half the track. There's anti-gravity gimmicks in the levels that Mario would later copy in Mario Kart 8 11 years later. The adventure mode has this frenzy system where a meter slowly charges with your teammates throughout the race, after which you're able to use as many random items as you can before the timer runs out. The visuals can be absolutely breathtaking for a PS2 game, and hell, they even brought back the staples from CTR that made the adventure mode stand out in the first place, like the three token collection races, crystal grabbing arenas, and the time trial relic races. <laughs> And since they already copied so much that worked from CTR, it would only make sense for them to copy the addictive, maniacal, and bouncy control style. 
but they don't. Even though you're not playing the game right now, you can probably see the downgrade just from the footage. Nitro Kart has absolutely no sense of speed or heaviness to the carts to make it feel like you're burning rubber against the terrain. It feels like you're floating along it. It's very flat and unreactive, which wouldn't be so bad if the jumping and drifting didn't feel limp and splatty and the turning didn't feel like you were unfolding an ironing board, but it does. Especially with the highest speed, lowest turn characters, unless you're drifting, it barely feels like you even turn at all, and you even slow down if you hold a turn for too long, because clearly someone thought you weren't going slow enough. Even driving into the levels is a pain. Driving into the levels is difficult. Stop judging me, it's very hard. Oh look, we've got a boss race heading our way. I wonder who will be fighting from the Crash Universe today. Yeah! Oh. Him. This delightful little cherub is called Crunk. Don't know who he is? Neither do I. And instead of being introduced in a comically personalized way where he's talking directly to the camera and intimidating the player, he instead gets forced into racing us by Velo. And then he says, Nah, I don't want to race them, they're smelly. And then Velo says, Oh, come on, please, Daddy. And then Crunk says, Yes. Uh, yeah, that is the quality of the boss races we have in Nitro Kart. And as for the race itself, well, I've got to be honest, I'm not even sure it was a race. See you later, monkey beta! The pathetic boss races aren't all either when it comes to the difficulty of Nitro Kart. In fact, when you mix in the Team Frenzy mechanic and new boost formula that is outright broken when you get the hang of it, this ends up becoming the easiest kart racer I think I've ever played. And the boss races don't even allow you to use Frenzy, so that's how easy they are. Topping all of this off is a piddling number of tracks compared to CTR as well. <laughs> That did not feel good. And I don't even want to know what noise you'd make if you did feel good. And even though this is supposed to be a high-tech advanced PS2 follow-up to Crash Team Racing, Nitro Kart ends up being one of the most unpolished games I've ever played. Constantly clipping through the floor is one thing, but it's another thing when the frame rate tanks whenever there's more than three carts on the same screen. The shields don't even work half the time. I genuinely love the track designs and the visuals of Nitro Kart, but even if you can get past the performance problems, there's no point coming back to this whatsoever since it controls worse than Crash Team Racing and doesn't feel as good to play, which in a kart racer I would argue is the main thing you need to get right. That's why games like Mario Kart 64 or Double Dash hold up so well after all these years. Yeah, they've put some of the tracks from these games in the future installments, but you can always feel safe going back to these ones because you know you're going to be having a great time controlling the karts. Oh, and by the way, the loading screens are terrifying. Crash is dead! Okay, then hopefully I can feel a bit better after I revisit a game I replayed countless times as a kid, Monsters Inc. Scare Island on the PS2. This is, in fact, the same game as the PS1 Monsters Inc. game that I know a load of people played when they were younger. I think it was called Screen Team. But to be honest, I never played that one, and I didn't even know it had a PS1 version until I got a demo disc for it long after I finished the PS2 version. It's the same game essentially, it just looks better and runs smoother, but better graphics or not, God help me, it doesn't do much for Scare Island. Water News looks like a raisin, and Sully here has more teeth than face. Onto the training mode then, and who do I pick? Well, based entirely on the way that they walk, I'm not a fan of Sully's extending stretchy net. So I guess I'm gonna have to pick Mike. Bugger! I think I made the wrong choice. I wonder what happens if you pick Sully. Hey, hey, I'm the monster. Oh, you are? I didn't notice. This training mode sucks, no other word for it. I get that it's a tutorial to ease younger players into the game, but this goes on for way too long since each room of the stage goes over every individual move you have. There's a room for jumping and a separate room for double jumping. That's how redundant this whole thing is. And in every single room, you get to listen to Roz talk at you. And after a while, she starts to sound like a massive sneeze. So we get out of the training mode and into the actual stages, which are free roaming 3D environments with sub areas you need to unlock and edges you can't Cross. The game itself is kind of like a Mario 64 collectathon mixed with Ape Escape, but for babies. You run and jump around, attack enemies, and collect this stuff called ooze in order to fill up a meter. After you've filled it up enough, you then go on the hunt to catch these robot children. Thank the Lord we're not hunting real children. And if they're the same color as the meter point that you filled up to with the ooze, you can adequately scare them. Scare enough of them, and you clear the level. Well done. Unlike Ape Escape, though, where searching for these escaping targets and catching them is fast paced, reaction heavy, there's usually platforming or puzzle solving to get around, and it takes one swipe to grab them afterwards as a nice payoff, Monsters Inc. instead just places the kids everywhere in not very difficult locations and then forces you into a button mashing scaring game every single time you find one of these things. And the higher colour level they are, the more button mashing you have to do. This gets immensely tiring insanely quickly. There's nothing fun about this and not rewarding even slightly for finding these things in the first place because you don't just get to pat yourself on the back and move on like an ape escape. To be fair though, it is funny once or twice to see some of the final scaring animations. <laughs> 
In fact, while we're here, was I the only person in the world that thought it was completely backwards in the movie that Sully was considered the scary one and Mike was considered the funny one? This thing is freakish. Why aren't kids scared of him? Look at him. The worst that Sully can do in this game is... <laughs> Okay, fair enough, he's pretty scary. The facial animations aren't the only things I'm not too sure about on the production value, though. It's all over the place throughout the game. Check out these water physics. It looks like they're trying to escape the game. Sometimes the models look absolutely fine, and sometimes they make me want to off myself. And they also reuse the same victory animations for the monsters when they grab the main metal collectibles of the game, which is fine, but these animations are in sync with one specific line of dialogue, and the characters say different lines for different medals. So where this is perfectly fine... Not bad for a guy with one eye! This just looks dumb. Who's the man? <laughs> I'm sorry, how does it go? Who's the monster? With a knife! For a nice bit of replayability, as you go through the game, you unlock more tools to use to access areas you couldn't get to before. And if you quit a level, thankfully, the amount of ooze and other collectibles you got on the level is stored, making the dashes towards the final collectibles and children to scare much easier. And check this out, you even get to race Randall as a makeshift boss battle, and these bits are really fun, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, you're more of a challenge than I thought. Yeah? Well, you're more tooth than I thought. Mm. Yeah, you know, the classic skate skateboarding series? Metal Gear Solid? After the original Metal Gear Solid on the PS1 blew everyone away with Solid Snake being the only character in a video game able to pull off a 1080 degree quadruple pop shove it, here he is back at it again on the PS2 and pulling off some steezy tricks all up in Arsenal Gear's rectum. Yes, that's what it's called. You are skating on a robot's poo muscle. This is the most incredible yet most uncanny thing I've ever seen. Obviously, if you know MGS pretty well, this may appear to be a joke or a fan mod on top of an existing skating game, but no, this is an official Metal Gear Solid skating game with its own kick-ass hard rock remix of the theme song. How did this come to be though? How do we go from a story-driven stealth action game involving social engineering, conspiracies, artificial intelligence, evolution, existentialism, censorship and child exploitation and end up with Solid Snake doing some gnarly grinds on top of a terrorist base? Well that's because this is actually a bonus feature on the re-release of the original MGS2 known as Metal Gear Solid 2 Substance, but only on the PS2 version. It's a great little pack, it comes with the main game obviously, but also gives you a making of DVD, more than 350 VR missions, the chance to replay the main story missions from Snake's perspective instead of Raiden's, and this bloody ridiculous skateboarding minigame built entirely on top of the engine for another Konami game that had just been released, Evolution Skateboarding. I guess they wanted to try advertising this game to me by slipping it into a Metal Gear Solid skin, but they overdid it if you ask me, because I've got absolutely no reason to play that one if I've already got this. Look at it, why would I ever want to play the other one? One year later in 2007, Chrome were brought back on to continue the story in The Legend of Simon, the Empty Niece, and it follows on directly from the last game. The not bad guy possessed by the real bad guy, Cinder, gets saved from Simon, so he takes her home, she leaves one day, and Spyro dies. Oh wait, no he didn't. Spyro the Eternal Knight is nearly exactly the same as before, so automatically I know I'm not going to love it, but there are a few neat little additions here. There's added slow-mo to take down animations, there's more areas to explore for upgrade material, which is very welcome, there's way more jumping and gliding sections to break up the combat, the elemental breaths actually provide you with different kinds of attacks rather than just different coloured variations of the same basic attack, and this final blast move looked cool before, but now it can rip through the fabric of reality and turn Spyro inside out. On paper, I should really get along with this game, even though I still don't like how Sparks looks like the mask and Spyro somehow looks even more oblivious than before. Spyro, your place is here. Your destiny is here. Uh, but is it just me, or is this game way harder? Like, annoyingly harder. I don't know, what do you think, Elijah Wood? It's dangerous for her to be outside the temple at night. Oh, yeah, alright, I see where you're coming from, I understand your opinion. I don't know if I'm just exhausted after playing through 12 games up to this point, but I found Eternal Night to be so much harder than A New Beginning, and not in a good way. It was harder than arranging a funeral on WhatsApp. The starting enemies from the beginning of the game do not let up. Everything attacks you relentlessly, and your health drains like a... Drain. Especially when you get stun locked into a group encounter and they just tag team spam attacks until you're out for the count. This happens way too frequently. You still attack slower than the enemies do, but now the lack of being able to cancel out of a combo or dodge roll to get the hell out of there makes that so much more apparent. And hey, look, they brought back one of my favorite parts of the first GBA game, Season of Ice. Off-screen dogpiling. Yeah, remember that? Isn't it fun? I think the devs knew how much harder this game was than the first, and that's why they put way more health and breath power crystals around the place to help eliminate 
alleviate the beatings, but the issue is the lack of mobility. If you get into a bad spot during a fight, you will not be able to move over to these crystals fast enough before it's game over again. I found myself doing so many pot shots and running away just to survive. And yeah, the ice breath here is much more useful than the first game and does make crowd control a bit more manageable, but it's too little too late, man. I just can't be bothered to see what else the game has to offer me after such an awful first impression. And listen here, all right, I love a long cutscene. I'm a rock solid hard man. Give me uninterrupted dialogue and dramatic pauses all over the place. I can handle it. But we're dealing with a story that isn't deep or interesting enough to justify how many cutscenes are piled on here. Sometimes back to back. It's like if someone sat you down and showed you a lore video about Barney. Ooh, what's that? We can slow down the game at will? Gee, that's neato. I always wanted to turn a Spyro game into Enter the Dragonfly on command. And before you ask, no, slowing the game down doesn't help with large brutal group encounters that much. And even if it did, the game doesn't slow down around you, you slow down as well. So you're either choosing unfun, unforgiving alleyway mugging or Shadow Legacy on purpose. I have never wanted to stop playing a game as quick as this before in my life. And it's really annoying because I was really enjoying all the good changes, but the rest of it... Nah. I don't feel like cheese grating off my fingers for fun. I already do that! Let's go. See ya! Huh.